This lecture we're going to discuss transcription, which is how the genetic information obtained in the DNA is utilized in the cell. So this is the very start of how we use DNA to perform functions in the cell. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to identify the steps involved in transcription, list the enzymes and structures necessary for transcription, compare and contrast prokaryotic versus eukaryotic transcription, and define numerous terms including transcription, messenger RNA, antisense and sense strands, RNA polymerase, promoter, housekeeping genes, global regulation, operon, and antisense RNA. So the central dogma to molecular biology is the fact that we start off with the genetic material, which is DNA. From DNA, we have transcription to make messenger RNA. Once we have our messenger RNA, we then undergo translation to make our proteins, and the proteins are the workhorses of the cell. So this lecture is focusing only on transcription and the making of messenger RNA. The role of messenger RNA in the cell, messenger RNA is a working copy of genes. So messenger RNA carries the genetic information to the entire cell. Transcription is the transfer of information from the genomic material DNA into the messenger, which is messenger RNA. In transcription, it's very similar to the process of replication. So just like replication, you have to pull apart that double-stranded DNA into two separate strands. Then from one of the strands of DNA, which is called the antisense strand, you make a complementary messenger RNA. So that messenger RNA that's made is going to be the complementary sequence to that antisense strand of DNA. The only difference is that since it's RNA, the thymines are going to be replaced with uracil. RNA is synthesized in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, just like DNA is synthesized in replication. Keep in mind that chromosomes carry thousands of genes, and only a certain portion of genes are used at any one time. So transcription of a set of genes is only going to occur when it's needed. So a gene is what is going to become a, ultimately a protein. You're not going to transcribe every single solitary gene in the body simultaneously. So only messenger RNA transcription is going to occur for that segment of DNA or for that gene when that gene is needed in the cell. How is messenger RNA made? Well, RNA is made by RNA polymerase. Just like in replication, we have DNA that's made by DNA polymerase. RNA polymerase binds to DNA at the start site of a gene and opens up that double helix. RNA polymerase makes RNA from that one strand of DNA. So one strand, the antisense strand of DNA, is the template for messenger RNA synthesis. So once again, you have your double-stranded helix. It separates into two separate strands. One strand is the antisense strand or the template strand. This is the DNA strand that messenger RNA is transcribed from. The other strand is called the sense strand or the coding strand. The other strand is not used as a template. So this strand actually has the sequence that's going to match the messenger RNA strand that's made, except the messenger RNA is going to have uracil instead of thymine. That's why the other strand is called the coding strand, because it has the same sequence as the messenger RNA strand that will be made. 
So here's a schematic where you have your RNA polymerase. It's going to attach to the 3' prime end of the DNA because RNA is synthesized in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. You're going to, um, RNA polymerase is going to make a complementary nucleotide of messenger RNA based on that antisense strand of the DNA. So for example, you have the TAC GCG, that complementary messenger RNA that's going to be made across from the T you're going to have A, across from the A you're going to have U because we don't have thymine and RNA, across from the C we have G, across from the G we have C and so on. So your messenger RNA continues moving along that DNA strand until it gets to the end of that gene. This messenger RNA is then going to move out of the nucleus and that is what's going to be translated into a protein which we will discuss in the next lecture. RNA polymerase, that enzyme that makes the messenger RNA from the DNA template. RNA polymerase is made up of several protein subunits. A very important subunit is the sigma subunit. This subunit recognizes two specific sequences on the opposite strand of DNA. This is the minus 10 region and the minus 35 region. How you find the minus 10 and minus 35 is you go to the very first nucleotide of the gene and you count backwards either 10 bases or 35 bases. In DNA, if let's say you're reading the textbook or reading an article, you'll see a term called the upstream region. When anything is referring to the upstream region, that's the stretch of DNA in front of a gene. The promoter is the region where that RNA polymerase is going to bind in order to start transcription. The consensus sequence is necessary for the sigma subunit to bind. So the minus 10 region should read TA T-A-A-T. This is called the TATA box. The minus 35 region should read T-T-G-A-C-A. -A. So these consensus sequence are what is going to be read by the sigma subunit and the sigma subunit will recognize these and then latch on. Now they could be off by one or two bases and the sigma sub subunit can still recognize them. So the strength of that promoter depends on how closely it matches that ideal consensus sequence so it can bind. So the promoter region, you have your plus one, the very first nucleotide of the gene, then your minus 10 region and your minus 35 region. Your minus 10 and minus 35 has your consensus sequences that your sigma subunit of RNA polymerase is going to recognize and bind. Once that sigma subunit has found the pr promoter and RNA polymerase comes in and binds, the sigma subunit can then drop off. The remaining portion of the RNA pr polymerase, the core enzyme, is what's going to make the messenger RNA. We have our double-stranded DNA helix. RNA polymerase is going to come in and bind. That double helix is going to unwind into two separate strands. One strand is the template strand of DNA and that's what the messenger RNA is going to be made from. So transcription stops at termination and the Termination varies between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So in bacteria, there are two different mechanisms for transcription termination. There's the row independent and the row dependent. So in the row independent, you have a terminator sequence that's going to tell RNA polymerase to stop transcribing. 
the termination sequence is two inverted repeats separated by six bases followed by numerous A's. And those two inverted repeats are on the opposite strands of DNA. And what happens is those repeats can actually pair up in the RNA and form a stem loop or a hairpin structure followed by a run of use. In row dependent termination, you have a protein factor called rho that destabilizes the interaction between the template DNA and the messenger RNA, thus releasing that messenger RNA. In eukaryotes, a little bit less is known there. You have cleavage of the new transcript followed by template independent addition of A's at the new 3' prime end in a process called polyadenylation and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So in prokaryotic termination you have your messenger RNA that's made, you have these um, repeat regions that can form a paired up stem in RNA and an unpaired loop followed by a sequence of U's. So what happens is your messenger RNA is made, you have those inverted repeats that form the little loop that causes the RNA polymerase to stall. Once the RNA polymerase hits the poly A tail and the, you get the U's in the messenger RNA, you get disassembly of the messenger RNA from the template DNA. So what genes are made or what we call turned on? Some genes in the cell are on all the time. These are called constitutively expressed genes. These are usually housekeeping genes. Housekeeping genes are absolutely essential for cell function. So constitutively expressed genes have a minus 10 or minus 35 regions that are absolutely identical to the ideal consensus sequence and they are always recognized by that sigma subunit. However, there are other genes, non-housekeeping genes, that are only needed under certain conditions that a cell may be in. These genes usually have poor recognition sequences that aren't recognized by the sigma subunit without an accessory protein. And accessory proteins are gene activator proteins. Gene activator proteins, you have these proteins that bind to DNA and help RNA polymerase come in and bind so that you can get transcription. And these activator proteins are going to be different for different genes. In eukaryotic cells, because eukaryotes are more complex, they have multiple activator proteins that are called transcription factors. So when you have transcription in a eukaryotic cell, there are multiple transcription factors that come into play when you have transcription. So think of your activator as a helping hand and that hand is going to come in and bind and then it's going to grab that RNA polymerase and bring it down onto the consensus sequence and say okay now let's we need this gene right here let's transcribe. Also, like we have activator proteins, we have pr repressor proteins. And repressor proteins are proteins that turn off genes. They're also called negative regulators. So they work similarly to activators, but they have the opposite effect. They're going to turn off that gene. So what they do is they bind to the DNA and they block the action of RNA polymerase. So unlike the activator that's like a hand that latches on to RNA polymerase and brings it in to transcribe, the repressor proteins are going to bind to the operator sequence and block that RNA polymerase from binding. So whether a protein is an activator or a repressor, it needs signal molecules. Regulators have to fit into binding sites, 
and when a regulator protein binds to the signal molecule, that protein changes shape. So whenever a protein operates by changing its shape, this is called an allosteric protein. We have global regulation in our cells where we have a co coordinated control or regulation of large groups of genes. And the proteins that are involved in this process are the global regulators. Operon. Operons are common in bacteria but not in eukaryotes. So an operon is a cluster of genes that are all switched on from the same promoter. So they are transcribed consecutively from the same promoter. So each gene doesn't need its own promoter. So the lactose operon or lac operon is a very common operon in the bacteria E. coli. So in the lac operon, you have your operator, you have your promoter, and your promoter is going to transcribe three genes, lac Z, lac Y, and lac A, that are all present in an operon in E. coli. In cells, we also have regulation by antisense RNA. An antisense RNA is RNA that's complementary in sequence to the messenger RNA, so it can actually base pair or hybridize with it. So the messenger RNA is transcribed using the antisense DNA strand or the template strand. If you make an RNA from the non-template strand, you'd produce an RNA mole molecule that's complementary to the messenger RNA. So that antisense RNA can then base pair with the messenger RNA, which is going to prevent the messenger RNA from binding to the ribosome, which is going to block translation or the development of protein, which is the, what we're going to discuss next. So transcription differs slightly between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, transcription occurs in the cytoplasm right alongside translation. And also in prokaryotes, messenger RNA is usually not modified. In eukaryotes, transcription occurs in the nucleus. Once that messenger RNA transcript is made, it is then transported to the cytoplasm where translation occurs. In eukaryotic cells, DNA is wound around histones to form nucleosomes and packaged as chromatin. Chromatin influences the accessibility of the DNA to all of those transcription factors that are found in eukaryotic cells. Also in eukaryotic cells, messenger RNA is modified through RNA splicing, 5' end capping, and the addition of what's called the poly A tail. So the messenger RNA processing, we have polyadenylation, capping, and splicing. In polyadenylation, messengers carry a sequence of polyadenylic acid at the three prime terminus. This is called the poly A tail. It's just a series of A's at the three prime end. These A's are not coded in the genomic DNA. They're added onto the RNA using an enzyme called polyadenylate polymerase. You can get a run of up to 200 nucleotides of this poly A tail in a mammalian messenger RNA. So we also have capping. In eukaryotic messenger RNA, the RNA is blocked at the 5' prime terminus by a 5,5 pyrophosphate bridge that's bridged to a methylated guanosine. This structure is called the 5' prime cap or the cap. This cap confers a protective function and also serves as a recognition signal for the translational apparatus. We also have splicing. 
In prokaryotes, we have our genes that are uninterrupted open reading frames. However, in eukaryotes, we have our coding regions or our genes, and these are our exons. These exons are separated by stretches of sequence called introns. Well, when we have when we make messenger RNA, those introns are spliced out so that we only end up with our exons or our coding sequences. There are two different sites where you can go and watch great movies on transcription. So keep in mind transcription is a message. The transcription of DNA makes messenger RNA. RNA. Messenger RNA is the messenger. It does no work. In order to perform any work in the cell, we need proteins. So that messenger RNA needs to be translated into proteins, and that's our next lecture.